Good morning. Welcome to worship today. It's the second Sunday of Easter, the 11th of April. We're going to be, for the next seven weeks, and we talk about this every year, that the season of Easter is not just one day where you put on your Easter hat and you wear your tie and uh, eat dinner afterwards with your family. The season of Easter in the church is actually 49 days long. We treat it as a, a, a continuation of one long service. Uh, to that end, we will be for the next seven weeks, uh, and I'm kind of excited for this, um, talking about, well, the resurrection, of course, this is what Christians do, reasons why you should actually believe it's true, uh, reasons that you could give to other people uh, when they would ask you, well, why do you place your faith in the fact that 2,000 years ago you think some guy rose from the dead? We're going to work through some of these questions and arguments and uh, come to a point of realizing we have very good reason to place our faith in the resurrected Jesus Christ, not only 2,000 years ago, but that he promises one day he's going to come back and he's going to make everything new, that the resurrection was a prelude to a greater resurrection, a resurrection of uh, those who believe in Jesus Christ. One day we will be a part of his brand new kingdom. Uh, all of these promises really kind of hinge on whether this guy that they killed on a cross 2,000 years ago, did God really bring him back to life? So to that end, we're going to spend the next seven weeks uh, thinking through that pretty carefully. Not only for your, our own edification, it's good for us to hear again that Jesus is risen, but especially that we could share that with other people who might have questions about that, and a lot of people do. So that is what we'll be up to for the next 49 days, well, 42 days from now. So I'm looking forward to that. Uh, there is church council this coming Tuesday evening that was mentioned in the bulletin there. The uh, other thing that we will announce this morning in trusting to the resurrection, our, our good friend Reverend Brian Gegel passed away yesterday, if you hadn't heard that. Uh, he had been down in Illinois. He had just started working at a church when he came down with what they diagnosed as ALS or something close to it. And uh, he did not last long, so... We'll remember in, his, in our prayers uh, now in the days going forward, uh, leaves behind two kids. Josh, we all know, lived here in town with Brian, and uh, his daughter, Jessica, who is going to be married later this year. So, uh, tough time for them, but we will hold them up in prayer, and we'll en we, en we entrust Brian to this resurrection, right? This is our hope as Christians. We stand in graveyards and say, one day... Brian will rise, and, uh, and he loved to proclaim that promise. And so while we're sad to uh, announce that news, on the other hand, good for Brian. He has uh, met the goal of his faith, and uh, we believe he was not disappointed at all. Good for Brian. The rest of us, uh, our psalm for the day, Psalm 148, is in praise of all things that God has created. And our opening hymn, based on Psalm 148, if you'd like to stand, Earth and All Stars, it's right at the end of your green hymnal, 558. Victor 
Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Blessed are those who call on the strong name of the risen Lord. As we gather in the victorious name of Christ, let us open our hearts to him and confess the ways in which we have failed to follow his will and the ways in which we simply neglected our calling as his disciples. Lord of heaven and earth, of the living and of the dead, we come before you confessing our sins, asking for your gracious mercy. By our human nature, we are sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By your loving kindness, we implore you to grant us forgiveness and restore us to your salvation, that we might live holy lives here and now and be with you in the final resurrection. Amen. So you'll hear today from our gospel lesson from John. Through the gift of the Holy Spirit, God declares to all who believe and confess their sins that they are forgiven and restored to a right relationship through Jesus Christ. We have been redeemed and renewed by Christ, our Passover Lamb. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, let us walk in the newness of life, following our Lord Jesus in holy obedience. Amen. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God who went to the cross for our sake, the love of the Father who put an end to the power of death through the resurrection of Christ, and the promised Holy Spirit who gathers us together be with you all. Thank you. Together we pray. Gracious God, through your Son's resurrected presence, you transform us from frightened, self-absorbed people into a community marked by peace, forgiveness, and mercy. Guide us to faithfully be signs to the world of your abundant grace and love. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. You may be seated. The very first Christian church, as they would gather together, we read today from Acts chapter 4. Um, a lot of these people, you have to understand, were eyewitnesses of the resurrection as well. And it completely changed the way that they looked at one another. Um, and the way that they even uh, held on to their possessions. And so we read about the very early church. These are, the, uh, these are within the first weeks and months after Jesus had risen from the dead. This is Acts chapter 4. And during the season of Easter, instead of reading the Old Testament for our first lesson, we spend time looking at these early eyewitnesses and early believers in the church. Um, and they remind us that Jesus is alive and this is what it looked like to them said, Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they held everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. There ends our reading. Our psalm today is printed in your bulletin. Since it's in bold print, you can read together with me. Uh, Earth and all stars, and you'll recognize uh, other hymns, of course, based on one of these great hallelujah psalms, number 148. Together we read. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord from the heavens, praise him in the heights. Praise him, all you angels of his, praise him, all his host. Praise him, sun and moon, praise him, all you shining stars. Praise him, heaven of heavens, and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded and they were created. 
He made them stand fast forever and ever. He gave them a law which shall not pass away. Praise the Lord from the earth, you sea monsters and all deeps, fire and hail, snow and fog, tempestuous wind doing his will, mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, wild beasts and all cattle, creeping things and winged birds, kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and all rulers of the world, young men and maidens, old and young together. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name only is exalted. His splendor is over earth and heaven. He has raised up strength for his people and praise for all his loyal servants, the children of Israel, a people who are near him. Hallelujah. Before we read John's gospel uh, today, we're going to read from one of the letters that John wrote to the church. It's called 1 John. We'll be reading chapter 1 into verse number 2 this morning. And uh, many years later, even after John wrote his uh, gospel, as he was writing letters to the church, one of the things he kept appealing to them to do was to listen to him because he was there. He touched, he saw, he heard, he knew the resurrection was true. And you hear that in these words this morning. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life, that's Jesus. The life was made manifest and we have seen it and we testify to it and we proclaim it to you, the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we have heard from him, and we proclaim to you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness... We lie and don't practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, We make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation, the covering of our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. There ends our reading. If you're able, please rise for the reading of the gospel. This is from John's Gospel, the 20th chapter, uh, very close to the end of the uh, Gospel. This is John recounting the story. On the evening of that day, the resurrection day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they're forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We've seen the Lord. But Thomas said to them, Unless I see the hand in his hands, the mark of the nails, and place my finger in the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Now, eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. And although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Thomas, put your finger here. See my hands and put out your hand and place it in my side. 
Do not disbelieve, but believe. And Thomas answered him, My Lord, my God. And Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you've seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. There is an expectation in the Holy Scriptures that just because you weren't there on Easter doesn't mean you don't get to believe in the resurrection. As a matter of fact, the Scriptures say uh, without a doubt, and they testify and they proclaim that this is something that we are to believe. This is something that we're to sell the farm and to place our faith in Jesus and his goodness to us, his death and his resurrection and the future coming kingdom. You are expected to believe this even though you weren't there. I'm expected to believe it even though I wasn't there. It's good to just hear that once from the scriptures. Blessed are those who have believed and yet have not, have, and have not seen. And John understands why he is writing a gospel down. He's writing these things down. He'll write three letters to the church and he will write the book of Revelation, a vision that he got and what God tell him to do. John, write these things down, put it in an envelope and mail it to these seven churches that are being persecuted around, the, uh, around your area by Emperor Nero. Remind them of what is to come. And God always expects them to believe that and to trust in that. And so we're going to spend the next seven days, or seven Sundays together, uh, thinking about the historical resurrection of Jesus from the dead, the expectation that we are to believe that, we are to place our faith in it, we are to trust it more than anything else in this world, more than any other message of salvation that will come into our ears. This is the gospel we are to focus on and to focus on only. And so we're going to do this for the next seven weeks. We're going to read and we're going to ask some questions. Why should I believe that? Why should I believe some ancient guy named John? He lived 2,000 years ago before the scientific revolution. Why should I believe that guy? Why should I believe the Apostle Paul? Why should I believe St. Peter? Why should I believe any of these people? Right? They, they don't live in the modern age like I do. If they had, they would probably change their mind. Why should I listen to some 2,000-year-old guys instead of somebody nowadays? Why should we do that? Why should we turn away from the idea that the resurrection of Jesus is just a myth that religious people do because they can't handle living in this world? This is their escape. This is their drug. That they somehow believe that one day their bodies that are dead in the ground are going to come back to life. People will call that a myth and they'll actually look down on us and they will scoff that we would believe such a thing. Why should we stick to it then? I want us to see the world today and tomorrow and the future that Jesus has planned for us. Uh, I want, to, want us to lean into these things and be able to communicate them to other people around us who have questions that don't know this yet. Remember, John said, I'm telling you these things so that my joy might be complete it's not complete without telling you this good news. And I want us to be the kind of people after Easter that we can do the same thing. Just like at the end of the gospel, Jesus breathed on him. He says, as God sent me here to the earth to do something, now I'm sending you to continue doing that very same thing. These are the kind of things we're going to talk about during the next 42 days. So for today, our guest preacher, the Apostle John, no, he's not here, uh, unfortunately, at this point, uh, he, his body is in the ground, but his spirit is away with the Lord, awaiting the resurrection. So he's going to speak to us, not in person, but the next best thing. He wrote down everything that he saw, and he passed it along. I doubt that John, as he was writing down the Gospel of John, or as he was writing this letter to the local church, ever thought that there'd be people 2,000 years later in Minnesota, wherever that is, um, that there would be people still listening to his eyewitness testimony and that we would be believing in Jesus because of him. He might not have thought that, but this was God's plan all along. 
was for the scriptures uh, to be put together so that we can open them up together as Christians and read them, and that we would believe that God works faith in us even as we read these stories. And so today, the Apostle John, second most prolific author in the Bible, uh, in the New Testament. Uh, New Testament has 27 books. John wrote five of them. I've already mentioned them to you. Uh, the only person who wrote more was uh, the Apostle Paul. We'll hear from him, of course, during the season of Easter. He wrote uh, 13 of the 27 books. Good question us is a good question for us today is why should we listen to John? What makes him an authority? Why should I listen to him instead of other people? What makes his words more trustworthy than modern day words about Jesus? Are they trustworthy enough for me? Are they trustworthy enough for you to entrust your lives and your faith fully and completely to them? Well, to answer the question, why should we listen to them? This is the main reason, the Apostle Paul and then today John, they're eyewitnesses. They were there. They are the ones who know that Jesus is risen from the dead. And here's the thing, if Paul or the Apostle John, as we're talking about today, if they didn't actually believe that Jesus rose from the dead, do you think they would have taken the time and the effort to write the gospel story and to cook up some different ending about Jesus rising from the dead? Would they have done that if they knew that was a lie? Right? Would they um, spend their lives trying to convince people that Jesus was truly the Son of God risen from the dead, even when it costs all but one of the disciples their lives. Uh, ten of those remaining 11 disciples and many others will give their lives as martyrs, testifying to the fact that Jesus was risen from the dead. And would they do that if they didn't really actually get to touch Jesus' hands and his side? Would they be willing to keep up a lie in a hoax that long? I don't think so. I want us to start today in the epistle of John. We're going to read here in a, one second, but this is one thing that's important to note about John. This, this to me, adds some credibility to his story. Uh, the, not the Gospel of John, the letter of 1 John, written uh, in the year 90 AD, 90 AD. Now, if you want to do a little math, uh, the date of the resurrection, the crucifixion, 32 to 34, let's split the difference. We'll call it the year 33 AD. That's usually the, the year that most people would give for Jesus' resurrection. If he wrote this letter in the year 90, quick math says that's 57 years after he touched Jesus' hands in his side. Now, if this is a lie or if this is a conspiracy, you think he's gonna keep it up for 57 years and do so publicly? There's preaching going on here just simply by knowing when he wrote that letter. Sixty years, six decades later, he is still doing that work of proclaiming the good news. It hasn't changed because he touched, he saw, he heard, he spent time with the risen Jesus. If you want to know why I believe in Jesus' resurrection, it's not because I watched something on YouTube, right? It's the eyewitnesses. It's watching these people throughout the New Testament. That's why it's so important for us to spend time in God's word. They, they, their stories keep reminding us over and over and over again that they actually experienced the risen Jesus. They touched him. He was not a ghost. This was not a mass hallucination they touched. The Apostle Paul will go on to say he'll list at least 512 people that encountered the risen Jesus and would say the same thing. And he even says, many of them are still alive today. As Paul's writing his letter, there's still a lot of people running around alive at the point he wrote 1 Corinthians that experienced the risen Jesus. These are the reasons that we believe, and that's why these things were written down for us. Sixty years later, he was still at it. And so if you want to look in your bulletins there, 1 John chapter, we're just going to read that first verse. So as he's writing to the church, he reminds them, here's why you should listen to me. He says, that which is from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, and which we have looked upon and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. He was there. He touched, he saw, he heard. I tried to think of a, a modern day uh, illustration that might, might help us to think through this because that's what I do sometimes. I like to compare uh, things in the scriptures. How would I explain this to maybe somebody who has no idea about the resurrection? How about this? Um, if I was to say to you, I once heard a story about a man who walked on the moon. 
And you'd say, oh, really? Okay. Um, and most of you would say, oh, yeah, I saw that video. But there's plenty of people who would disbelieve that video. There is. There's a lot of conspiracy out there that they never put a man on the moon. Not only did Jesus not rise from the dead, but there's never been a man on the moon. So I could stand up here and I could say I once heard a story about a guy who walked on the moon, and you may or may not believe me. Maybe they've seen some movies as well. What if I said this to you? And to tell you this story today, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Neil Armstrong. And Neil Armstrong came walking down and I'd give up my pulpit. Well, no, I wouldn't. Unless he was preaching the gospel, he can't stand in the pulpit. Well, we would give him this lectern and we'd say, Neil, tell us about the moon. And then he would start talking about how he got moon dust on his boots. And maybe, yeah, I'm sure he'd have a lot of great, fascinating stories to tell about the day that he stood on the moon. You're going to believe it because of me or Neil Armstrong? Who votes for Neil? Who votes for me? Anybody? Don Daigle. God bless you. You're wrong, but God bless you. I would listen. He's the one who actually was there. And so I would believe him. Well, this is what we do when we read the scriptures. You're not believing in Jesus because I told you to, or, and I'm not doing it because my Sunday school teacher told me to. That's how it gets started, right? And they're doing a good and faithful thing by teaching kids that. But they, too, are just passing along the goods, we're reading about stuff that eyewitnesses wrote down in the scriptures so that we might believe and have life in Jesus' name. John was there. He heard what Jesus said. He saw that Jesus was raised from the dead, and he touched Jesus who was raised from the dead. And so in his gospel lesson today, as he's thinking back on those days, as he's writing down his story that he has no idea where this gospel is going to end up, but he's writing it down because the Spirit has told him this is important. He told the story, he says, it was that first Easter night, three days after Jesus was crucified, me and the other disciples, we were locked in the upper room. We were afraid of the Jewish authorities. They had just killed our Lord and Master, and now the body was missing. We were afraid. Maybe they were going to be coming after us. Maybe they thought we had stolen his body. We were afraid because some of the women who are part of our group said that they'd seen Jesus walking around outside of the tomb in the garden on that Easter morning. We read that story last week, didn't we? The disciples don't know what to do, but they're afraid. And so they are locked in this upper room. And it was there, John says, that Jesus came and he appeared in the room. Even though it was a locked room, he came and appeared in the room and he said, peace be with you. And it says, then he showed us his hands and he showed us his side. And then we knew what the women had told us was true. Jesus was risen from the dead. We felt him with our own hands. You could hear that when John's writing 60 years later. He goes, "This things that we have heard and we have seen, the things that we have touched. To John, that's so important. He goes, I know beyond the shadow. I'm not telling you this because somebody told me Jesus was risen from the dead. I touched the scars. That's why I'm writing these things down, and that is why you should believe me. This is what the Gospel of John tells us, that Jesus is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. And that becomes the confession of the church. Why did Jesus rise from the dead? Let's answer that question because the Gospel tells us today. Usually we talk about doubting Thomas at this point. It's good to read his story today, and uh, on behalf of all who say, I'm not going to believe unless I've touched his hands and his side. We listen to Thomas's story every year, and I'm glad for that. But when we do that every year, we often miss this other interesting little part in here that is really worth us paying attention to, because it tells us now what to do, that we believe Jesus has risen from the dead. Jesus says, peace be with you. He has show and tell, shows him his hands and his side. And then it says, the next thing he does is he breathes on them which in a day of COVID sounds like a bad idea, right? You don't want to breathe on people anymore. You wear your mask and stay away from people's breath, unless it's Jesus's breath. I think Jesus wants to come in and breathe on us. That would be just fine. Because out of Jesus, his mouth, uh, and we're going to confess the Nicene Creed, the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and from the Son and is equipping these disciples to continue doing his work. Why did Jesus rise from the dead? It's for the forgiveness of sins. It's the entire reason that Jesus came to the earth in the first place. It's 
fulfillment of, prom- uh, of prophecy, of promise, all the way back to Genesis chapter three in the Garden of Eden when God tells the serpent, one day Eve's offspring will crush your head. You're gonna strike his heel, and we saw that on Good Friday. The devil thought he had won. Ha, finally killed Jesus. They thought he was the son of God, but I guess I showed them wrong. The offspring of the serpent strikes Jesus' heel, but on the third day, God raises Jesus from the dead. He defeats the schemes and the power of the enemy. We call it in the Lutheran church, probably other churches as well, sin, death, and the devil. The resurrection of Jesus does that. It is a fulfillment to the promises so long ago that started in the Garden of Eden. We took the ashes on our forehead. Remember, you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Like our good friend, Pastor Gagel, he took those ashes before the promise there. One day that body of yours will wear out, but it's made in the sign of a cross because... God raised him from the dead. He is alive, and one day he will be too. Fulfillment to the promises. There's many promises in the Old Testament pointing to Jesus. It's why Jesus was born on Christmas. God in the flesh, born so that he could what? Take on human sin. Take his perfect life and offer it as a once and for all sacrifice for sins on that cross. The resurrection validates what Jesus has done. This is a sacrifice that is pleasing to God, and it is not the end. It is the gateway to eternal life. He dies on that cross. He tastes death like every human being will. He is not unwilling to go to the places that you and I will experience, and the cross shows us that. Jesus dies so that he tastes that curse of death just like any of the rest of us. He feels forsaken by his Father as he hangs on the cross. He tastes all of it on our behalf. The resurrection then, God's validation of Jesus' ministry. He rises to defeat sin, death, and the devil, but Jesus also rises as the first of many who are to come. And those are the future promises of the scripture. Why should we entrust ourselves to those promises? Mainly because Jesus is risen from the dead, and there's a whole bunch of people who touched his hands and his side who remind us of that today. And we're so glad for that. In the gospel lesson today from John 20, John says, now, Jesus did a lot of things when he walked on the earth. He says, but these things are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, that he is God's son, and that by believing in him, you would experience life in his name, certainly an eternal life in the future, but there's resurrection life for us right here and right now. You can walk out of here today with renewed hope, right? You walk out of here knowing that there's still good and future promises and that Jesus is faithful and that he loves you so much that he would give his life for you and you feel treasured and loved. Even if you don't find it anywhere in the world, today you hear it from Jesus. I love you so much that I would do that for you. That's eternal life that you and I get to enjoy right here and right now. And we get to walk out this door and we get to be resurrection people in God's world. And Jesus says, remember, that's why God sent me for the forgiveness of sins. Now I'm sending you to do that same thing. Tell people that because of Jesus' death and resurrection, you can be reconciled with God. You can place your faith in Jesus. And on that day, your sins are taken away with you and you are given all of these promises. Jesus says that's gonna be the church's job. That's why he breathes on them is so they can continue to do that work. Another reason we believe this, these disciples, including John, they will end up giving their life as a result of this good news. They will not recant, they will not take it back when they are threatened with death. Next week, we are going to take a little time in our worship service uh, to remember Martin Luther. Uh, We celebrated the uh, 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation uh, about three and a half years ago, uh, October 31st, 1517, and we had a celebration of that. But next Sunday is the 500th anniversary of the day where Martin Luther had to stand before the Holy Roman Emperor and all of the big wigs in the church, and they said, Luther, take back your teachings. And Luther stands there and probably channeling his inner disciple, right? Thinking of all of these great faithful witnesses, all of the disciples that had given their lives to tell the good news of Jesus, Luther stands there in front of a bunch of people who can take his life, and he says... No, unless you can convince me by the scriptures that I am wrong, I will not take back a single word that I say. 
here I stand. This is what each and every one of the disciples does. When they are faced with preserving their life or giving it for the gospel, they end up giving it. Why? Because they heard, they saw, and they touched. And because they did and they wrote down their testimony and the Holy Spirit has seen fit to give us the Christian scriptures, we believe, we believe. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Our hymn, number 145, Thine is the glory. No more we doubt thee, risen prince of life, something like that. Number 145, let's stand and sing. I know it says the Apostles' Creed, but uh, during the season of Easter, we're going to read one of the other two creeds that we, uh, as Christians, subscribe to, the Nicene Creed. Uh, the church believes this is an accurate teaching of the scriptures. This is what we believe and teach. Uh, when we share the gospel with people, these are always good frameworks to have in mind. They remind us of the story. And so we confess. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, of all that is, seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven 
and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. At this time, let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus. We do pray for all people according to their needs. Gracious Heavenly Father, Jesus the Son, Holy Spirit, we worship you today as the three in one, that you existed in community long before you created the world, and you have uh, created uh, this uh, heavens and the earth. You've created us human beings to live in community, not only with one another, but with you. And today we are grateful for the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. You have removed the barrier of sin that separated us from you done so not only by his death, but also by his resurrection. And Holy Spirit, we thank you that you have delivered to us the words of the Holy Scripture, which includes us into that uh, resurrection life that Jesus has won. So this morning as the church, we worship uh, in peace with you through Jesus' resurrection. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We also hear well, Jesus, that uh, you expect us then to go out and to share the good news that our joy might be complete by letting other people know this great thing that you have done. We pray that you would breathe your Holy Spirit on us, that you would equip us, that you would arrange uh, conversations and meetings with people where we might be able to, to testify about your resurrection and bring hope to places that have not yet known it or perhaps have forgotten about it. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. We worship this morning. We know, Jesus, that you're seated at the right hand of the Father and you intercede for us. You hear our prayers. And so this morning as we pray, we think of the people that have been on our hearts and our minds this week that are in need of your help or your healing in any way. We pray for them healing and strength as they suffer and that they would experience you in the midst of their pain. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We do also lift up the families of those who are grieving loved ones. We think especially today of Josh and Jessica Gagel and their family and friends as they mourn the death of our brother Brian. He spoke words of resurrection many times at funerals and... uh, We celebrate with him today his uh, heavenly home going, and we know that he is now safe with you as he awaits the resurrection. And we believe that of all of the people in our lives that uh, we've had to say goodbye to. And so we pray that uh, this comforting resurrection message would strengthen uh, the giggles and any other families who are mourning today, that those promises would strengthen them as they do mourn. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And as Christians, we also lift up your world to you today. We long for the day you come back and make all things new and perfect. But in the meantime, there are trials, there are illnesses, there are so many things uh, that uh, get us to doubt the resurrection message. We pray that you would uh, help us to see that you are at work in this world and that you work all things for the good of those who love you and that this is all directed toward the day where you will bring the fullness of your kingdom to this earth. And so for this next week, we entrust this world to you, and we pray that you would help us to walk faithfully through it. These things we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our risen Savior and Lord. Amen. When Jesus announced that peace to his disciples, uh, when we share the peace with each other, more than wishing each other my peace to you, We're actually sharing Jesus' peace uh, with one another. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Thank you. Share the peace with those around you, please.
Our offering plate, of course, is on the usher's table out there, but as an act of worship, we continue to thank God for his gifts. Let us pray. Generous God, you have given us treasures too numerable to count. Grant us faith to be generous with all that you have first given us, our time, our resources, and our possessions. May we boldly trust that your providence, presence, and care are a never-ending reality in our lives. Amen. I had forgot to mention earlier, did everybody get one of the communion sets as they came in? If you haven't, raise your hand real quick and one of our ushers will get that to you. I really want you to enjoy the Lord's Supper with us. You got one? Okay. On the final night of his life, our Lord Jesus broke bread and he gave it to his disciples and he said to them, take and eat. This is my body. It's broken for you. Whenever you eat this bread, you do it in remembrance of me. He also took the cup of wine, and after giving thanks, he said, Take and drink, this is the new covenant. My blood has been shed for the forgiveness of your sins. Whenever you drink from this cup, do it in remembrance of me. Lord Jesus, remember us always in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Take and eat. This is the body of Christ. It was broken for you. Take and drink. This is the blood of Christ. It was shed for you. May the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus strengthen each one of you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Gracious God, you have fed us at this holy meal with the bread of life and the cup of salvation. We praise you for the glorious resurrection of Christ, which is a sign of your great love for your people. You have forgiven us through this sacrament and restored us to new and everlasting life. Amen. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Go now, in the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Closing hymn will be 543.
is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Thanks be to God.